What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the My Other Passion Podcast. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports, and today we're back with another interesting guest, Steve Pangburn. He's the CEO of Sodexo Live North America. This company is basically responsible for all the food and beverage, and I mean billions of dollars of food and beverage at your favorite stadiums and venues across the country. So whether that's Hollywood Bowl here where I'm at in Los Angeles or the 15 Super Bowls they put on, all the college teams that they're working with, they worked with Hard Rock Stadium for the Formula One Miami Grand Prix. They're all over the place. And personally, I wanted to find out more about this business. And I wanted to find out more about the man who's at the helm of this business. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get right into that. But first, let's hear from our partners at NetSuite. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. That's true when your business is growing fast, and that's even more true when there's a lot of uncertainty. Inflation is running rampant, supply chains are clogged, the labor market is tight. What does all this mean for your margins? Well, not every business is in the dark. In fact, over 31,000 businesses know everything about their numbers because they use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite is going to give you the visibility and control that you need over your financials, planning, budgeting, of course, inventory, and everything else you need to manage risk, give reliable forecasts, and improve those margins. NetSuite is going to help you identify rising costs, automate your manual business processes, and see where to save money. Know your numbers, know your business, and get to know how NetSuite can be the source of truth for your entire company. Right now, it's easier than ever to get involved. NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. All you got to do is head to netsuite.com slash my other passion. Once again, netsuite.com slash my other passion. You won't regret it. Now back to the show. Steve Payingburn, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, it's great to be here with you and all the people that are listening in. Absolutely. Um, I gave you a nice intro before this, but um, now that we're here talking, I, I really would love to understand you're the CEO of Sodexo Live North America. And I think so many people, including myself, once I started doing a bit of research into what the company is all about, they have come across your work. They have interacted with what Sodexo is putting out into the marketplace. This is concessions, this is venues, but from the man himself, who's at the helm of this business, can you tell us what you're all about? Absolutely. Well, first of all, uh, we can't wait to welcome back all of your listeners and welcome you back as well, Ernest, uh, to a venue uh, near you. And we're looking forward to the 2022 uh, football, uh, both pro and college uh, uh, seasons here. What are we all about? We're, we're all about making unique fan experiences. And, and I think you mentioned it uh, uh, earlier, uh, you had a unique experience. You didn't even know it was Sodexo Live. And, and we partner uh, with, our, with our venue partners to just make that seamless. We work as one team uh, with our venue partners to make a great fan experience. That's what we're all about. And that's what our people are all dedicated to. Yeah, the for the people who weren't listening uh, off camera before we started recording, I was telling Steve about my experience at the Hollywood Bowl. I went for a concert one year before you all signed your 10-year deal with them. And then I went last year, and I've been to a couple uh, since you all took over. And I just, I think it's one of the best venues in the world. I find it to be such a pleasant experience. Um but what is your role in something like the Hollywood Bowl? And I assume, you know, either it's different with some of the different sports stadiums and venues that you work with, or this is kind of your model going across all of them. But so much of everything points towards food, the, the dining, the, the concessions. Is that the focal point or are you all expanding into more of the larger, you know, experience overall? Uh, we're, we're all around the, the overall, uh, overall fan experience or guest experience and uh, what you experience at the Hollywood Bowl. We hope that you get that everywhere where you go in and you have an une unexpected, uh, great uh, experience, uh, notably around the food uh, and beverage, but that you say, wow. And that not only do you say, wow, but you have a great time. And like I've heard, you want to come back and do it all over again. That's our goal. And what we really work with our venue partners on is that it's seamless for the guests to come in and, and, and get into the venue, have a great experience, and then once again, uh, want to come back and do it all over. Yeah, I found that it was like the thing that really sold me is for something that is 10, 15 minutes away from my home in Los Angeles, it was like a festival-like experience almost, but contained within a single event. Um, I went to this jazz artist, Kamasi Washington, 
And it was really cool because he brought out Thundercat and Metallica and all this stuff. But I just got the sense that I wasn't at just a concert for the night. It felt more eventful. And what do you all do to ensure that? Um, like, even I remember just, you know, I had my kids with me. So being able to have, like, the parking that was super convenient. And it was just like a whole smooth experience. And I'm all about the live experience. And certainly as we're coming back, right, you know, everyone says that we're opening back up. I mean, we're open back up at this point. Um, concerts are in full swing. I have a whole slate of them I'm going to for the fall. We got some sporting events coming up. And from A to B, like, what are you all doing? What is Sodexo Live doing to ensure that the guests are having such a great time? Absolutely. And, and coming back out of COVID, so uh, stadiums are going to be full and we want everybody to have uh, just a fabulous time because they deserve it after a couple of years of, of staying at home. Uh, we, we really partner with each of our each of our venues as one team and really really make it a unique experience. What you had at the Hollywood Bowl, we're designing that as well uh, in Miami, for example, at Hard Rock Stadium. So whether it's Formula One, whether it's the Miami Dolphins, uh, we want you to, when you get into the stadium uh, that you know you're in Miami. You have a unique feel of Miami uh, from the food you taste, from the smell uh, the smell of the food. And that once again, you have that experience that you can't get anywhere else. You can only get that at, at Hard Rock Stadium in Miami or in New Orleans at the Superdome. It's all about being in New Orleans. And so you have that unique experience. So we designed that uh, very intentionally uh, with our culinarian teams. We have invested in uh, innovation chefs and, and, a, and a really large uh, culinary team to make that experience unique, design it, and then deliver it to the quality uh, that people deserve. Can you take us a little bit through that process? Like, that sounds fun. Innovation chefs, where do you try out hundreds of different foods? Like, how does how does one go from concept to execution in this field? That's a, that's a great question. And uh, I'll use an example. It can feel a little bit more tangible. Uh, Indianapolis Colts. Uh, so uh, we spent uh, uh, a few days, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, working with them on presenting what the new and exciting uh, menu options were going to be for the upcoming season and getting their feedback. So working with our venue partners and some of the fans. So fans were invited to that, that event and we, we set it out in front of them and we asked them, what did you like best? What didn't you like? What would you like to see different? And we worked on it with them and came up with some really great uh, innovative ideas uh, that the fans are really going to see uh, in their plates uh, as they go to the stadium in, uh, in uh, Lucas Oil Field. How do you measure success? Like, obviously you can get feedback from people. That seems like a ground floor type of initiative. Um, but you put this big plan in place for the upcoming NFL season, for example. Is it just a matter of sales? You see where products are moving and you double down on those, the ones that aren't working, you keep it moving or you rethink how you're going to market them. Um, you know, what what almost keeps you up at night? What What stats or figures are you trying to improve? Well, first of all, fan experience. So, you know, how, how happy were you uh, going to the venue and are you going to come back? Uh, are you taking surveys though? Or like, how are you determining that? Yeah, uh, we take surveys. Uh, uh, our venue partners take surveys as well. They ask, well, how, how, how smooth was it to get into the stadium? Uh, how, how, how happy were you, uh, were you with the uh, food selection, with the quality? Uh, how, how was the game? <laughs> how was the experience? All of that is uh, we ask and we're part of that with our venue partners. And then we act on what we're getting in terms of feedback. And then, of course, it's all around the data analytics, right? So it's what sold the best, uh, what, was the, what was the fastest serving outlet. A lot of uh, today's uh, environment is around how fast can you get people uh, through the concession lines uh, back to their seats so they can enjoy the experience, enjoy the, uh, enjoy the game. And so we also measure how fast you know, time of transactions, what have you, so that, uh, that we're always improving there. So you all are in such a diverse suite of venues, like you mentioned, Hard Rock Stadium in Miami. Um, I know that, like we talked about, Hollywood Bowl, uh, I believe Nashville Super Speedway, right? T-Mobile Park up in Seattle, where you also worked with Amazon to do the Just Walk Out store. 
uh, several others. Like there's there's dozens. I think I think then you all just lock in a, a deal with Roland Garros for the French Open. I'm correct. It's like you're global. Um, you're across different sports, different types of entertainment. Um, how important is the football season in particular? Because I know that's sort of the pretense of our convo. We have football is starting, college football, professional football, and the NFL. Um, and when you look at, for instance, TV ratings, 75 of the top 100 U.S. telecasts last year were NFL games. It just completely dominates the landscape. And is there a similar type of ratio when it comes to the revenue that you all are pulling in uh, at Sodexo Live? Uh, no, actually, it's more it's more diverse across across our portfolio. So, uh, Sodexo Live, as you just mentioned, is very global, uh, and we we do sporting, uh, but also cultural destinations and major uh, major events. Uh, we do, as you mentioned, the football teams in Miami, Indianapolis, uh, New Orleans, uh, Seattle for for the baseball, uh, but we also do the Tour de France that uh, that you've heard of, uh, Roland Garros. We have five uh, Michelin star restaurants uh, in, uh, uh, in in France. And we'll be partnering with the Olympics in Paris in 2024 to serve all of the all of the athletes and, and guests uh, coming to uh, to Paris for that. Uh, so globally, we're about 40,000 people uh, in 500 venues. But here in the U.S., we're 14,000 people, and our teams are all right now, as you mentioned, focused on the pro uh, the pro uh, football season that's kicking off right now. You know, we just finished preseason. Now it's we tested lots of different things in our in our venues. Now it's time for the game, <laughs> and we're all excited for that in a, in a couple of weeks here, uh, kicking that off. Uh, that's where you definitely do get the uh, get the sixty to sixty five thousand people every day, or every game, uh, but also college uh, sports. So we do the big house. We have a hundred thousand people come in uh, to each of those games, and uh, we do University of Florida, Harvard, uh, a big mix of of those pro and uh, college sports. And it's right now the season. Uh, the fall is incredibly exciting time for our teams busy uh, but exciting because this is where it all happens between now and and february it's, it's just a huge activity for our business yeah so Dexo, um the larger company i know headquartered in paris uh i believe acquired center plate however many years ago it was about four years ago and then just recently last fall rebranded center plate to Sodexo Live. And so you're looking at a huge Fortune 100 company. I think the last fiscal year was like $22 billion in revenue. And then more than half of that is coming from North America. And then as I've read, about a billion of that is coming from uh, Sodexo Live. So these are, these are big numbers. We love numbers over at Front Office Sports. What are you doing to contribute to that and like what are the pressures from Sodexo um you know they they're making this investment they rebranded they want to go hard with football go hard in North America what what are the expectations like we have a lot of ambitious people who read and follow and listen to FOS and I think a lot of them are either sitting in a C-suite position or they're aspiring to one and so I think whether it's um, for like some foresight and advice, or it's just relatability among your peers. Um, it's interesting to understand what, what the position really requires. Um, you know, CEO, I think in our culture, people know hard work comes with it, but it's like, it's a lot of glamor. It's a lot, or it's perceived glamor. It's a lot of, I'm the big boss and I run the company and, um, I'd love to hear some perspective on you know what your day to day is like, and you know what pressures you might face, and and ultimately you know what what responsibilities you feel like are bestowed to you, and and what you do to try to live up to them. Great question. <laughs> uh, but first of all, I think the most important thing is that is that we choose a business uh, uh, that's our passion, uh, because as you said, it's a lot of hard work, uh, and you can't imagine uh, how hard uh, you have to work. So it's got to be. Uh, where you're passionate. And I think if you have the passion, then you're able to invest and do all the hard work uh, that's necessary to, 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 to lead, a, lead a team, lead an organization. I don't think anybody could have imagined what it would have been like to lead a company through COVID. Uh, and so that's what, that's what I did or that's what we did uh, as, a, uh, as a team. 
going from having great business to we had, we did a Super Bowl, and then the next month, uh, the business was was gone for for a, a couple of years. So leading leading uh, through that was incredibly uh, challenging, but uh, but we learned a lot. And I think every CEO, every leader that uh, had to go through that learned a lot about themselves. Uh, learned a lot about caring, caring for people, uh, and and we are we're a company uh, that cares. It's a family-owned business. It's probably one of the biggest mom and pop. Uh, organizations in the world we employ, you know, Sodexo employs globally over 400,000 people, uh, but it's family owned. Uh, in fact, my boss is, is one of the owners of, of the company. And when I started working uh, for Sodexo 18 years ago, I worked for the founder. And so you really do feel a, a lot about, it's all about family and caring. Uh, it's also about results and of course, uh, uh, the guest experience, but it's also, we're a family owned business and, uh, and they care. And that makes a difference for somebody like myself. And so what do, what's important to me? I don't want to disappoint our fans. I don't want to disappoint the family because I feel part of, of that family as well. So it's making the right decisions and doing the right thing uh, all the time. Um, now, we all make mistakes, uh, but uh, we, we can make mistakes. As long as you're doing the right thing and making the right decision uh, for the good of, of the client, the fan, and, and, of course, the company, you know, you're, you'll be fine. But it's got to be... What did you... Sorry. I know it's well, the passion is important. I mean, people say that for a reason, but you know, you get out here into the real world and you know, salary might be on point, but if your heart's not in it, it's going to be really tough to, to get up every day and go make things happen. What did you learn about yourself during this unprecedented time? Like you said, all of a sudden you go from hosting a Super Bowl to your business is up in the air. Like we legitimately have a moment where we don't even know if live events will be back. It's just, and maybe people in your position knew and had the foresight to say, okay, like it's coming. We just have to weather the storm. But either way, most businesses are not just decimated overnight like that. You know, even everyone who had their struggles in COVID, no one suffered like a live events based company. And so you said all of that challenge taught you things about yourself. What's what's one thing that kind of sticks with you uh, that you've been able to apply in the couple of years since that all first went down? I think it uh, it wasn't just about me. It was about the team and uh, the people uh, came together like a team had never come together before. And we we went from doing that Super Bowl to opening up COVID hospitals uh, within two weeks time because we do a lot of convention centers as well. And those were taken over uh, and transformed into into hospitals. Uh, and so our team probably never worked harder, uh, didn't have a lot of revenue coming in, but we never worked harder uh, seven days a week getting things ready. Fortunately, we had that because that gave us something to think about and do and do for the good of our cities, do for the good of our, of our local communities. Uh, we transformed a convention center in San Diego into a homeless shelter with our partner. Um, and we, in, in Miami at Hard Rock Stadium, we fed uh, the senior community. And so we had to think completely differently from one day to the next. And the team's commitment was just incredible uh, in, in doing so. And I think that's what I learned is that people, they, ad they adapt, they adjust, uh, and you have to give them the freedom to do so. I couldn't be telling everybody what to do because I had no idea. But what I was able to do was, A, keep, uh, keep the teams on board. Uh, they knew they had uh, job security and, and, and were committed to our company. And, and they came up with all the ideas. They were the ones that implemented it all. And, and I just accompanied them, uh, giving them the empowerment to do so, but accompany them in, in, during that time. And that's been a lesson learned for me because uh, as we go forward, we're going to come up with new and exciting things all the time. To, it, to be able to adjust to them, you have to empower people. And that's what I probably took out of it was empowering uh, my teams to, to come up with the ideas and actually do it uh, because they know a heck of a lot more than I do about, uh, <laughs> about uh, serving people in their local communities. So the local piece is really important to you all from what I've read. Um, and even what you mentioned earlier, between New Orleans or whatever stadium you want to embody and evoke the culture of, of that space. What do you do in like, what's one of the cooler pieces? Um, like I was reading about the Colts and the players got involved and you were talking about testing with the fans and all of that. 
what's what are some creative ways to tap in with the local culture um of a of a football city or a college sports town how do you make it happen and i think it's it's we all, we also help them boost their own uh local community involvement and just an example is is a uh, the Colts uh, all pro linebacker uh, Shaquille Leonard. Uh, he he and his wife have set up a uh, 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 an association uh, foundation uh, to uh, to help out children uh, in in their local communities. And so what we're doing is we've come up with a uh, with a a way to to link uh, what we're offering one of the offers in the stadium to Shaquille uh, Leonard's um, uh, foundation, and proceeds will be going to help that uh, help him and his wife do the good thing that they're doing, while at the same time uh, being exciting for fans to also be able to participate uh, in, in that, in, in, in the Colts organization and, and doing something good for, uh, for their local community. So we, we tandem, tandem, we partner uh, with our teams uh, and with our clients uh, in order to do so. Also, something that uh, we love doing in, in uh, all of our uh, venues is, is looking for the local connection to uh, local chefs, uh, local minority and women-owned businesses. Uh, help them. Uh, and that's something that COVID taught us as well, is how can we help those local uh, small businesses? We're a big company. Uh, how can we help them uh, do things differently, do things better, and, and give them opportunities to, to partner with us uh, as we have a, a much larger uh, uh, client base and, and, and consumer base? And so, and, and partnering with those local companies uh, really makes a difference from a social uh, perspective and, and doing the right thing, as I mentioned earlier. Do the right thing. That's that's something that's doing the right thing. It's not necessarily all about profits. It's about doing the right thing as well. Yeah, but that's that's business, right? That's that's like the eternal argument: profits, human interest. Um, how do how do you balance that? Like, is it do you, do you have a tough decision to make sometimes, or you know, are you always going to go for what's in the best interest of uh, of your community? Like, you know, it's a it's a real world out there, you know, and that's something I'm always uh, fascinated by, you know, like the reality is we are in a profit driven society and, uh, you know, no, however many billions as you all apparently made, so Dexo made 22 billion in revenue last year. I'm sure the goals are to take it higher than that. Um, and so, you know, are you a numbers guy? Are you always chasing the numbers or do you just do your best job and, and see where it nets out? Well, I'm a former CFO, but I'm, I, I must say I'm not a numbers guy. Uh, I'm much more around, um, uh, first of all, doing the right thing and providing purpose uh, to our people. Uh, we're, we're a service business, so people are our greatest and our only asset. And so if you have happy people and you have the best people, you're going to win in the long term uh, because People that aren't happy aren't going to be going, doing great services, but people that are engaged are going to provide the best uh, services. So uh, we do that. We measure our team's engagement. Uh, so I, the numbers I like to measure are engagement of my teams and client retention. And, and so that's those are critical. We have a 99% client retention rate. That means we're doing something right. 80% employee engagement rate, doing something right. In the long term, that'll make perfect sense for our company. Again, it's a family owned business. So it's not just what's the next quarter's results. What's important is what are the long-term uh, results of, of our business? Are we, are we growing? Well, we're going to grow because we have the right people. We have the best clients and, and then other people and clients are going to want to join us because they see that the, our references are, are speaking, you know, great things about us. Uh, they could go to a game and, and see it in action. <laughs> Yeah, come come see. Yeah, like I'd like to invite all of your listeners as well. Come come see what we do. Come to Miami. Come to Indianapolis. Come to New Orleans. Uh, you'll you'll see what we do. And I think that's and come to the Hollywood Bowl. You'll see uh, the impact of uh, of people, uh, great people, uh, having having a purpose and uh, and working as a partnership, as one team with our with our client uh, venues in, in in providing a great experience. It's not all about money. Not even for our uh, our clients. It's first of all, they always talk about guest experience. That's the very first thing anybody ever talks to me about is how do we make a great guest experience uh, or fan experience for everybody that comes into the venue? The money's always secondary or, or later down the road, but uh, it's about the experience first. How hard is probably, you know, the mother of all events, the Super Bowl, 
you talked about the one uh, that you all pulled off right before COVID, but Zodexo Live has run about 15 Super Bowls I've seen. And you talked about how important the football season is. This is the culmination of everything. So what does it take to execute a Super Bowl? You're going to have people from all over the world now. It's bigger than the community. How do you pull that off? Uh, so we, we actually have a, we've invested and I've invested in, in our uh, culinarians. I mentioned innovation, but also a culinary network across the, across the U.S. And, and North America and even the world. And what we bring all that support in to support our local venue, they couldn't do it on their own, that's for sure. And so we bring in a, a, a group of support and, and culinarians that, 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 you know, second to none that, that make sure that we deliver that unique experience because fans come, they may only come to one Super Bowl in their life. Uh, and some don't even get that opportunity. So we have to make that special. And we do that by bringing in all this, uh, all this support. But I must, I must say, uh, doing F1 in Miami uh, this year was like three Super Bowls uh, in, in a weekend. And It so, looked nuts down there. We had a writer down there. And even just watching on TV, I was like, F1 has really arrived in America. Because you could just see, like, the amount of celebrities down there, the stuff going on that weekend. So... All right, three Super Bowls. Tell me, tell me how how that happens. And how yeah, three you, Super Bowls. How you deliver on this grand vision? Three Super Bowls in one weekend, and all outside the stadium. So the stadium was kind of a centerpiece, but all of the the services were were around the stadium because that's where the track was built. And so uh, again, we brought in uh, our culinary team, and we prepare this. This this gets prepared a year in advance. So as soon as the Hard Rock Stadium announced that they were uh, signing a contract for Formula One. Our team started preparing and working very closely with uh, with uh, Tom Garfinkel and, and his team, uh, uh, Jeremy Walls, in preparing uh, for the Formula One event and what was important to them. So what was really important to them was that unique uh, experience, Miami feel. Uh, and so we designed that with them and, uh, again, put all the resources necessary. And it was an incredible event. Uh, and we just we just put as many you know potential possible resources as possible to ensure that it was a great event and it, and it came off perfectly well uh, the teams were tired after at the end of the three days but they'd never had such an amazing experience that will remain in their minds and, and they'll want to do that over again because that's how impactful it was for them in their careers everybody who worked uh, on that so did you help design that like marina situation uh, we are part of it, so it's the the Hard Rock Stadium team that designed it, and the food is part of that. So we work as as one team with them to say, okay, well, what's the what's the unique food uh, uh, part of that that's going to make it a unique experience? Uh, I don't know if, if your if your colleagues were able to visit uh, that part and if they what they thought about that and if they if they remember the food. You know, I have to give Owen a call and check in, um, but I do know he was updating us in the Slack the whole weekend and then wrote a few articles about it. And I think on a journalist front had a great experience. You can go read about that. But what do you, what's the biggest lesson that you take away from a Super Bowl or a Miami Grand Prix? Um, what is it that makes these events that are so larger than life ultimately a reality? Well, you, you give it your all uh, as a company. And so there, we hold nothing back and we partner uh, again with our, uh, with our clients. So we have to be in lockstep with uh, Hard Rock Stadium on the whole planification and, and, and delivery of the event. And it's a, it's a success together. Uh, and and we, we celebrated that together. Uh, similarly for the, the last Super Bowl we did, that was at Hard Rock Stadium. Um, we partnered with, uh, with Tom uh, to eliminate single use plastics. Uh, we had to work together uh, to for Pepsi to come in and 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 have you know no no more plastic water bottles. Uh, so we worked with them to get uh, only uh, recyclable aluminum cans in. That was the first time that they had done that for a major event. The first time that plastic, single use plastics have been eliminated. Um, but it's it's really all of us working together and giving it our all. Uh, and we're not counting uh, you know hours and and dollars there. It's really putting all of our company behind that to make it a success. And in, in each case, when you do that, uh, it's successful. What's like the biggest surprise though? What's something about behind the scenes, uh, executing one of these events, particularly a food, food and beverage that people 
the average person, the average fan just might not understand. Um, I don't know if that's from a monetary standpoint or inventory standpoint, but what's like that crucial piece about running a Super Bowl or a Miami Grand Prix that uh, you love to give people a little insight on? I think it's just the sheer logistics uh, of, of that. Uh, the Grand Prix or the Formula One was so much different than anything else that had ever been done. Uh, in fact, it was still move, uh, moving moving pieces until uh, until you know race day <laughs> essentially, <laughs> and we had to deliver to thirty different kitchens around the around the campus. Uh, and so, what happens? Well, our teams come in at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, and and they start working uh, at, at that time. And and uh, and our culinarians are cooking because there's a lot of food to get prepared and 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 to cook in order for people to come in and at game time or race time, uh, be able to, to experience, uh, uh, you know, the food and you can't, you can't, uh, wing it. You have to, you have to have the experience to know how to do it. Uh, we had to have everything uh, all prepared and ready to go, especially in F1 and because you couldn't go back, you couldn't go back to the, the main kitchen in the stadium because you had the racetrack. And so everything was closed off. So if you didn't have it, uh, prepared and, and logistically uh, sound, you failed. And so because of the planning, uh, we had it all there. Nobody went home hungry or thirsty, uh, and, and the level of services was, was was fantastic. But it's all in the planning and the preparation and the know-how, because you just again you don't wing it. Uh, this comes from doing those those 15 Super Bowls. Uh, we know how to do it. We know how to put our culinary team uh, to action, and and I, I I believe that we have the best culinary team uh, in the business, and they're just incredible. They just have this know-how to deliver any size, any quality, anywhere. I love it. I need to to get to more of your events. Maybe um, get me hooked up with a you know all access pass. Just eat up everything I want in the stadium. Now, I do that anyway. So well, you, I I think you're coming to F1 next year, right? <laughs> this is my invitation to you and and, and your guest <laughs> to come. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we we went for the inaugural, and um, you know, it's the type of thing between Miami. You got Las Vegas coming up. Uh, in general, I love. I love seeing the explosion of F1. Like, let's step out of just, you know, your your business and your CEO role for a second. Just what do you what do you think of the way that the F1 is growing in America and how have you all been able to capitalize on it? Because you're coming from France. The Dexo is based in France. You know, the culture is heavy there. Now you're trying to make it happen in America and be you know, one of the companies that's responsible for it being a successful experience. Um, so, so when you step back and just look at this movement overall, you know, what, what can you see from your vantage point F1 specifically? No, I, I think it's exciting. Uh, I lived in, uh, in uh, Europe or in France for uh, uh, 25 years. And so I saw the F1 uh, there and how, how important it was to the lives of many people there. And then uh, seeing that it wasn't so much uh, in the in the past in the U.S. Uh, uh, and, and then all of a sudden, uh, the U.S. started getting uh, these F1 races: uh, Miami, uh, Las Vegas. Uh, there's one in in Texas. Austin, as well. yeah. And yeah, plus Netflix. I mean, all of that combined, uh, people people are now interested in it here in the U.S. Uh, I don't know how many people have, have told me uh, what a what a experience it was to watch the Netflix and then actually follow uh, the race and, and, and the drivers themselves. So there's a real connection there between uh, the, you know, the, what they're seeing in the, in, on TV and, and what they're, uh, what they're experiencing in the sports world. So I think it's all came together at the same time, which is, which is fantastic. And now it's, it's our job uh, to ensure that that continues, uh, that people really come to these events and, and, uh, and have a unique experience. What are you doing to get ready for the 2024 Olympics? We're, really just a couple years out at this point, which is surprising. I'm like, two years? What? Is that real? Um, so I know if I'm thinking that as just a fan and a viewer, um, you all must be feeling the heat in some ways, you know, being responsible for food and beverage and that overall live experience. Absolutely. And, and again, that comes from the experience, uh, the know-how. Uh, we actually uh, did the Tokyo uh, Olympics as well. And I don't know if you recall, but uh, a week before the games, they actually canceled, uh, you know, visitor or fan experience there. So our teams had worked for for four years to prepare it, and then a week before it got uh, it got can uh, canceled. Not the games themselves, but the the actual fan experience. 
And so that was very frustrating. So I think our teams are so excited now that uh, Paris is coming. Uh, it's also in our headquarters. Uh, so in Paris, uh, so it's really where, where we are extremely uh, uh, prevalent and we have uh, you know, lots of different uh, businesses there. And so we've been organizing already and it's around the corner. I mean, 2024 is, is tomorrow in, in uh, logistical terms. And so we're working with all of our, our partner chefs. So we have partner chefs uh, in, in France, but also our Michelin star chefs as well. Uh, and all of our business coming together as a team, working with the, uh, uh, the organize, organizing committee to make that a unique experience as well. So again, that one team approach, we don't do it on our own. We do it as a team, which is very much in the sports world. That's, that's what works. <laughs> There's no I in team, right? So, uh, and we do that from, a, from a, a service partner perspective as well. If, we, if we're on our own, we're going to fail. If we're working as one, uh, there's nothing we can't succeed. So how did you get in this position? Ultimately, Steve, I want to talk about the man himself a little bit. Um, I love all this context on Sodexo live, but you know, you went to university of Montana and then you did your accounting thing over at KPMG, which I was a business student as well, wound up in media, but I get, I get that whole big four grind. Um, my dad was a CPA and all that stuff as well. So like very familiar with that space. Um, but then you take that and go to Paris for you know, a couple decades. And then, you know, now you are CEO of Sodexo Live. Just, you know, I think I mentioned this earlier, but a lot of people who read and listen to FOS are really ambitious people. Um, they have serious goals for themselves and they ultimately want to make it in life and they want to be successful in business. And you seem to have somewhat of a potentially unconventional with the, the international pieces going from Montana to Paris. I think we can classify that as unconventional. Um, but I think also you're helping people realize there's so many paths, there's so many ways that your life and your career can unfold. And how do you go from University of Montana, KPMG to the head of Sodexo Live North America? So very much like you, my father was a CPA as well. And I always, I always promised I would never become a CPA. <laughs> it just happened, happened to turn out that way. Uh, you know, that, it's funny. Just, just we can relate here. I had no pressure from my dad. It was no, you better go to school and do this. It was just like what I viewed as how the world worked. It took me to get in and do internships in different fields to understand, okay, here's what I like. Here's what I don't wind up going to New York, get into the media game. Uh, but sometimes it's like that in your household. I was like, that's what you do when you go to college, right? Don't you go to business school and go either do marketing or finance or accounting and go get a job and make money? Like, um, but I think we both probably learned it's a little more complex than that. Well, I think we both followed our passions, Ernest. And so um, my passion, uh, and I'll get into that in a minute, but uh, uh, it's around it's around sports and food. And uh, and yours is in uh, is in the entertainment in industry and and. I think our, our business backgrounds will always help us uh, no matter what, uh, what uh, you know, world we go into, but uh, it has to be around our passion. And so just who I am, um, my father was a, uh, was a CPA uh, and uh, my mother was French. So uh, had a, uh, that's, that's where my connection uh, comes from. And so I was always American and French, uh, grew up in Denver and then, and then went to school at the University of Montana. Uh, and so I actually, uh, Follow, I actually fell in love with a French woman and, uh, and went over to France for a year and, you know, got a job working for KPMG. And from there, uh, it became 25 years, but, uh, that's, that's, I did the same thing. My dad did. He married a French woman. <laughs> and so, so I repeated that, um, in, in France, it was, it was a challenge because I didn't speak necessarily the language very well. Although I was French, uh, I, I grew up, uh, very much American. And, um, and so it took me a while to get you know, accustomed to the language. Uh, and, you know, one year turned into many years and I was working for uh, a company called Capgemini, who's a, a global IT uh, systems integrator uh, in internal audit. And I got a call from uh, Pierre Vallon, who was the founder of Sodexo. And so he, he asked me uh, uh, for an interview and you know, I, wow, that was, I'd never 
been interviewed by a billionaire before. <laughs> so right. I, was very, <laughs> I was very nervous about that. But uh, um, yeah, my, my first job when I was in, in high school was, uh, uh, was in a restaurant, uh, a Mexican food restaurant. And, and he felt that, you know, he saw that connection uh, and my passion for food uh, with what he was looking for to have a, a friend, you know, somebody with a dual uh, global citizen uh, of the world uh, type person working for him uh, directly. So I worked with him for about five years directly in a company that was worldwide. So he, he wanted somebody that could, that could speak to, uh, uh, to, to, to our American teams, to our French teams and, and other teams. So that op, you know, opened an, a unique opportunity uh, for me, but it was uh, great decision for me personally because it was getting towards my passion uh, getting away from, it wasn't my passion uh, and so i got into a business a company uh, a family-owned business that was passionate about food and and that was my passion as well and then coming over to the u.s after we acquired center plate that got me really close to my other passion which is sports so combining the sports and the food uh, it was just a uh, made a great career and and i definitely have no regrets about uh, about doing that yeah, it's it's great how things work out like that sometimes. Uh, speaking of things working out, you know, I think that sports is bouncing back and has bounced back in a pretty remarkable way. Uh, we went from the live events business being completely decimated to, um, you know, attendance records being set all over the past year. And just like, you know, you see some of these these revenue numbers and ticket sales and it's like people are really fully outside again we're not necessarily in this transitional space what were you able to recognize on the sodexo side that said okay like we're really back in business we're we're not trying to get it back we're not certainly in the spring 2020 or really all of 2020 doldrums um was there like an aha moment where it just all of a sudden you realized that you were good to go again and and everything would be all right yeah, that's a great question. I think the aha moment um, uh, has been uh, people uh, coming back and spending a lot more money than they did pre-COVID. So uh, people are spending 15, 20% more. Uh, and it's not just, it's not price. It's, it's a combination of a lot of different things that they were missing that experience. And so they come back to a stadium, to a concert, uh, uh, to a convention center, and they're coming back because they weren't able to for two years. And now when they come back, they want to fully immerse themselves in the experience and, and, and spend the money that, you know, that to do so, to have that. You that feel experience. like you were missing out for years. I know I've gone to a couple games and concerts and it's like, get whatever you want. Like we needed this. <laughs> exactly. And that's, that was kind of the aha moment. I was, I wasn't expecting um, to, to have those types of uh, increases in per caps, uh, but that it can, that continued. Right. So I thought, oh, that might be something that comes up and then comes back down. Uh, boy, was I wrong. Uh, it stayed up there and it's, and it's continuing uh, to grow. Uh, and, and now we're back uh, to uh, above pre-COVID levels in terms of in terms of revenue. Uh, and so that's great. I mean, that's not, now I, I realize that we're, about, we're beyond COVID and now people have gotten over that. And this upcoming season, there's there are even going to be more fans in the stadiums than they were uh, last year. Uh, and it's just going to be a. a what I expect to be a great experience because once again, people just want to be together and have that great experience and, and have fun. Uh, part of living is having fun. And so uh, people, people didn't get that for two years and now it's time. I couldn't agree more. I wonder is the transition to cashless part of these 15, 20% revenue increases from food and beverage? Like it's a lot easier. It's just a lot easier now. And um, I think you can attribute some of the growth and some of the bounce back to just sheer excitement to get back to live events. Um, but from a tech standpoint, how much is cashless contributing? I've seen uh, stuff about these like robotic pizza makers that you all have in the stash. Like how much does tech help facilitate uh, a financial gain? Uh, it definitely helps. Uh, it's part of it. Uh, uh, you people spend more uh, on a uh, on, on a cash list, whether it's credit card or whether it's the phone. Uh, you're not limited to that that twenty dollar bill, right? And and uh, and people don't like to use cash anymore. I mean, 
mean, that's what we've, we've noticed. So it's, Dude, it's I've crazy. seen, I've seen people on social media. They're like, if, if there's no Apple pay, like, I don't know what to do. You know, I find myself, even I have a card in my pocket and it's just like, mm, I'd rather just tap my phone. Exactly. Yeah. And, and what happened with COVID, you know, I would say, thankfully the positive thing coming out of COVID is that everybody finally went cashless. And so actually our teams were busy during that period, adapting our POS systems, our point of sale systems, in order to be able to accept the Apple Pay and uh, credit cards and, and eliminating eliminating the cash. So that is that is part of that fan experience. It's also uh, self-ordering, which uh, didn't really, uh, it wasn't very prevalent prior to COVID. Now it's very much prevalent. So people like to do their own ordering, whether it's touching, whether it's on their own phone, <laughs> or whether it's doing the, as, as you mentioned, the, uh, the just walk out uh, concept. Uh, it's changed the way people uh, consume in a stadium. And, and they'd like, they like to have options. So they like to have the traditional way of, uh, of concessions, but they also like to have uh, the, the self-order and the, and, the, and the order on the phone and the, and the pickup. So it's, it's really designing um, an offer that is inclusive of all of those elements so that you're covering all of your fans. And then, of course, keeping it cashless. So uh, we don't want to go back. We don't want to go back <laughs> 15 years. Uh, let's let's keep going forward uh, with with the technology and and we've we've seen it works and every you know everybody's happy and even more happy to to do so so uh, I, the next you know we'll we'll see what our fans are saying uh, this year so uh, the surveys are going to be important to us as they're all coming back uh, and the filling up the stadiums I can't wait to hear their feedback uh, in the fall as to what what do they like what do they want to see uh, improved or changed uh, and that will continually uh, permit us to to make uh, improvements. You speak of moving forward. One of the things probably just as much as anything with technology is just like the eating preferences, right? Like the prevalence of vegan options, gluten-free options, plant-based food. Um, what work have you all done to accommodate these changing tastes? Um, and like from a sourcing perspective, like like everyone's a lot more in touch with quality, right? Like I saw something about how um, for the final four, you all had 225,000 beverage units, 13,000 pounds of chicken. And the first thing I think is like, you know, especially with like meat and stuff, where is this coming from? You know, how are we making sure that, you know, all of this is just maybe a level above? That's what I've enjoyed about some of the Sodexo run things that I've run into. And when I told you my story about Hollywood Bowl, I was like, I'm having like a proper dinner here, kind of like I'm actually, you know, this isn't just venue food that I'm grabbing. Um, It was it was great. It was like I went out to dinner and there happened to be a concert going on. And even Hollywood Bowl, like Paul Simon famously got mad, right? Because the, the, the eating setup is like such a part of that venue. Um. But, but what are you doing to ensure quality and kind of cater to all these changing tastes? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there are changing tastes. You're absolutely, absolutely right. Uh, and many, many more uh, uh, different type of dietary restrictions uh, than we've ever had before. So um, first of all, we have one of the largest supply chains in the world, uh, giving Sodexo's uh, size. Uh, that permits us to, uh, to be able to be innovative in the supply chain, but also ensure the quality. Uh, because uh, it's very important that everybody uh, eats safely uh, in, in not only great food, but also safe food. So we have a very strong supply chain with lots of different uh, control points, but uh, our supply chain works very closely uh, with our culinarians. So it's our culinarians and our innovation uh, chefs that are working on designing those specific uh, need menus and, and, and specific menus that and new menu and local <laughs> menus that people want to try and, uh, and working very closely together and finding the right product um, and, and that also permits us to, uh, with the inflation we're having today, uh, today we're having 12 to 15 percent uh, food inflation. Well, that permits us uh, to, with our size and, and, and localizing it to, to offset uh, some of those increased costs, if you will, for our end consumer. So not only are they getting a, a, you know, the local food, uh, safe food, but also we're trying to, to make it so it's it, as price quality uh, offset and balance as possible. So thinking about how different people eat, um, whether it's, you know, the different, uh, different regions, you talk about speaking to the local flavor, different cities, um, talk about the changing taste, vegan, plant-based, all these different options. What about, 
like as a college football fan, just the schools themselves. You all are working with the Florida Gators, Gonzaga, uh, West Virginia, like all these different powerhouse schools. Um, do you have any insight into like what makes the dining operations different? Do the, do the Florida kids eat one way and then you have to change how you're approaching things over at Gonzaga? Like, like what is that process like ultimately? Well, well the process is, uh, is very much working with our, our venue partners. So uh, working with the uh, University of Michigan, for example, I'll give you a, a precise example. So we, we build um, new menu items uh, in, in advance of the season and we ask them for their feedback, but the students' feedback. And so what are, what are they liking? So uh, we're going to have a build your own impossible burger there or uh, uh, this year also a, a, a bourbon barbecued brisket. That's what that's what uh, they're looking for uh, at the, the big house in, in Michigan, uh, which is something different than than what we're looking for at the University of Florida. In, fa in fact, at the University of Florida uh, this year, uh, we just kicked off uh, the team feeding as well. And so we just had our showcase and, and kick off the team feeding with them. And it was an incredible event uh, with the uh, athletic department, with the, with the team. And they were just in awe uh, of what they were actually getting, the, the change that they experienced this year. Uh, and it's really working closely together. It's getting their feedback. I mean, who's eating it? Well, it's, it's the fans and it's the team. And, and we need their feedback working as that one team. If we're not, we're not going to be successful. So it's really partnering. And similarly with the, I mentioned the uh, Lucas Oil Stadium. Uh, we, we work, the, the event, the tasting event is, is developed jointly uh, with uh, the Colts uh, organization and, and our teams. We they even had cheerleaders there. Uh, they're, they're running that for their key, their key fans and, and really asking them to, 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 to get their input. So we do the same thing at, at the college level. Uh, what, what are the, what are the students looking for and what are the, what are the alumni looking for as well? Um, and a lot of it's also in the suites. So it's doing sweet tasting menus as well with the, the key contributors to the universities uh, so that they too uh, see a difference. As, as you mentioned, when you went to the Hollywood bowl, you go, like, wow, that's what we want uh, our, our fans and our, our guests to experience when they go to these venues. And th that's what they do in, in, in Indy. That's what they do at the, or, or in Miami uh, as well. Um, and so that's really what we design all of our innovation, our culinary expertise for. People are still going to want chicken tenders. <laughs> but <laughs> you're, ne you're never going to have a stadium that doesn't have fries, chicken tenders as an option. So yeah, I, can, I can only imagine how much, how much of that you have to bring. Every, in fact, like every Super Bowl or these big events, you always see this stuff published. That's why I know you had 13,000 pounds of chicken. Everyone's like, this many hot dogs are sold. This much is going on. You actually have to sit with that paperwork. <laughs> figure out what it all means uh but what's the wildest thing that you've seen in this space like you know i i wanted to speak with you because i feel like this is such a crucial part of so many people's experiences and you know whether you want to take that uh credit or not i feel like there's like quietly a rock star component to the concessions game um and to the food and beverage game it's like this is billions and billions of dollars that we're talking about you might just think oh chicken tenders but it's like it's massive it's a, it's a huge business um so what have you seen that you would say yeah you know you probably think of this really exciting thing that happens in the music business or the film industry or even on the field with sports. But here's the thing about food and beverage that they can make a movie about because it's so interesting and exciting and most people don't have any idea. Well, absolutely. I, I think the, uh, it, it's not the CEO, right? First of all, it's, it's the chefs. And so our chefs are our rock stars, uh, and, uh, following, uh, a chef in a day in the life <laughs> would probably be something that people would never imagine uh, happening. And uh, uh, we did we did a little bit of that at, uh, for F1 with uh, Chef Diani, uh, who was actually the first woman um, uh, Super Bowl chef. Uh, so when she did that in uh, pre-COVID at the uh, Hard Rock Stadium, and now her passion is 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 F1 and and uh, American football, but also uh, soccer. And so uh, just to see the passion of our chefs. And, and what they do uh, every day is just is just unbelievable. And those are our rock stars. Uh, just filming them, uh, I, I, I tend, uh, anytime I go to a venue, one of the first stops is the kitchen. I love to go uh, visit each of, our, each of our kitchens and our, our culinary staff because it's incredible what they're able to do 
in a, in a short period of time, uh, the quality they were able to put out, uh, they, they deserve all the recognition. Uh, the CEO deserves very, very little or zero. Uh, it's, the, it's those people that are doing that uh, in, in our kitchens and, and the team that, the front of house team as well, that's actually serving it. Uh, they did an incredible job in very complicated and log logistically challenged uh, environments with thousands of people running around them. They are able to get, uh, uh, to get the food in a, in a, in a great quality uh, delivered to people as they watch the game. So uh, that's what I think the, if there's something to, to, to look at, it's our chefs. Uh, and, uh, and I would hope that they would be able to be put up uh, as stars because they are. I love that. You, uh, you really have a lot of love for your team and it's nice to hear that. And in general, I think we've had a great convo here. I really appreciate you coming on and giving us a nice behind the scenes look at this, this booming industry. Um, before we get out of here, the last thing I want to ask you, because I'm hearing about all these experiences, all of this, you know, business knowledge and logistical insight, what keeps you focused outside of the work inside of the office? Um, you know, do you have things that you're really into that, that keep you sane or just, you know, keep your reflexes sharp? Um, because I think. You know, a lot of times I'll talk to an athlete on the show, uh, but they're also into acting or they're into fashion or they have these other things. Um, but a lot of times, like the CEO in your position, I don't think a lot of people are considering their world outside of Sodexo Live, Sodexo Live. And I would not be surprised if that is 100% or close to all of your time. But uh, what else is going on in the live life of Steve Pangburn that, that ultimately makes you able to function and be successful as a CEO? Well, I, I uh, try to play volleyball uh, with a group of people who have no idea what Sodexo Live is uh, or, or who we are, uh, uh, to play volleyball twice a week when I'm not on injured reserve uh, or, or traveling. And so off, often one of those two at my age uh, intervenes, notably the injured reserve part. Uh, but uh, that's that's really one of my passions. And my son, uh, he plays volleyball too. And, and my passion is to be able to play volleyball uh, with him and, and with a group of people because it's just a, a way of life uh, uh, for me and, it's, and it always has been. So I would, that's what I would say is uh, who I am uh, as much as I can. It keeps me sane because you're not thinking about anything else. You're, you're, you're in the game and, and, uh, and there with a group of people that also have the passion for the same game. Uh, it really makes, uh, makes your mind think about something else. Well, best of luck out there, um, you know, in the sand, beach volleyball. Uh, beach and grass, whatever it's generally our, our team plays on, on grass. So, but, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun and it's, it's, uh, it, we're, we're not all 20 year olds. So, <laughs> so we can't, we can't necessarily run around in the sand, uh, all day. So grass is a little bit easier at, at, at my age, but, uh, there you go. Well, enjoy yourself. It's, uh, it's great to hear that you're getting out there, keeping yourself well-rounded and, um, again, I love hearing about what's going on with Sodexo and, and really this whole crazy world of getting that food and beverage running uh, within all these iconic stadiums. So thanks for your time, Steven. Good luck with this upcoming football season. Uh, good luck with the Olympics. You got a lot of stuff coming up. So, you know, we're going to be expecting you to deliver. And so we can all have a great time when we step out and, you know, finally fill our bucket post-COVID. <laughs> Go check out these games and concerts. Please do. And I, again, I'd like to uh, extend my invitation to you and all of your listeners. We're, we're out there and we're ready for you to come back. And, and we just can't wait. My teams can't wait to provide you with an awesome experience, whether it's at the Hollywood Bowl, the Big House, uh, Miami, New Orleans, everywhere, Indianapolis. Please come. Uh, we want to make your experience uh, unforgettable uh, and memorable. So thank you so much for your time. For us. All right. We'll keep that in mind. Thanks, Steve. All right. Thank you. That's a wrap on another episode of the My Other Passion podcast. I want to thank Steve Payneburn for coming out and giving us all those behind the scenes insights on what it really takes to run a global food and beverage business like Sodexo Live. I mean, there's billions and billions of dollars flowing through these stadiums. And whether that's the Super Bowl, that's Hollywood Bowl, that's what they're doing down in Miami with the Formula One Grand Prix. I was pretty fascinated. You know, I am a big live events person. And whenever I'm in there, I am looking around and thinking about the logistics. So 
I love hearing how that business really works. I love the fact that we're so many guests in and we've had such a diverse cast of characters. And we're going to keep that going next week. My other passion will be back on Wednesday, as always. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Thanks for showing love so far. We'll be back soon.